So the reason why I'm talking about murder to missing Indigenous women and girls today is because Canada is killing our people. And if Canadians don't stand up and stand beside us and stand in partnership with us, more people are going to die. And this isn't something new. This didn't just start 10 years ago with the Picton Inquiry. This has been going on since contact and it is it has become a part of our society, something that's happening in plain sight, yet nobody seems to know about it. And we have to address it. We have to call to account governments for what it is that they're doing and their role in the actual violence and murders. We have to make the RCMP account for every time they rape or murder an Indigenous person. Every judge that's sitting on a bench needs to account for every time they rape or murder an Indigenous girl. And until we call out these state actors, and until we have these really uncomfortable conversations with Canadians, they're not going to understand why we're calling for a national inquiry and why we need an emergency action plan. It'll still be a discourse around crime and crime prevention and paying more money to the police. And I think we owe the families of murdered and missing Indigenous women more than that. We owe them the truth. Good morning. I'd like to get started. My name is Elizabeth Sheehy and I currently hold the Shirley Greenberg Chair in Women and the Legal Profession. And welcome to our second Shirley Greenberg Lecture for the winter semester. Today our guest is Dr. Pamela Palmiter, Chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. She is a Mi'kmaq lawyer, professor, advocate for Indigenous women's rights. She came in second in the 2012 election for National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations and was a spokesperson, organizer and educator for Idle No More. She completed her LLB at the University of New Brunswick and her Masters at Dell. She went on to complete her doctorate also at Dal, and her thesis was called Beyond Blood, Rethinking Aboriginal Identity and Belonging. Her many works and achievements have been recognized in 2012 by the YWCA, who named her Woman of Distinction in the Social Justice category. Also in 2012, she was inducted into the Bertha Wilson Honor Society by Kim Brooks, Dean of the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie. Brilliant, courageous, and determined to speak out on important issues involving Aboriginal treaty, land, and citizenship rights of, of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous women, as well as the prevention of violence, Dr. Palmiter is a trailblazing role model for us all. Thank you very much for joining us today for this lecture. Pam Palmiter. It's always an honor when I can travel from my home territory, Mi'kmaq territory, and go into another Indigenous uh, nation's territory and share our common experiences and, and share the issues that we have and, and work together collaboratively to find solutions. Um, I really do need to amend my bio though because that makes me sound like uh, a really nice person. Of course, Sun Media has given me the award of Bad Indian and Top 5 to Fear in Canada. So yeah. that's the real award. <laughs> and interestingly enough, and very appropriate for this talk, the reason why I was given Top 5 to Fear in Canada was because I was speaking out about murdered and missing Indigenous women. And I was speaking out about the very long history of murdered and missing Indigenous women in this country, not just the recent media phenomena. And that is a very uncomfortable truth for some people. It's not about evoking guilt. It's about saying, how can we restore our treaty relationships, our, our working alliances, and find a better way for everybody in Canada? And that's what this is about. So I thank the organizers of the event and and all of the uh, people who came to talk about this because it really is an important issue. My problem with this issue is that it's not an isolated incident. Canada is killing our people by the thousands and have been doing so for decades and decades and decades. 
it has been happening right in plain sight. How can something like this happen in plain sight? If we don't act now, if we don't demand more of this government, more people are going to die. You see it every week in the media when there's another call for an indigenous little girl who's gone missing. That's our collective responsibility to prevent that from happening. This isn't a matter of crime. Throwing money at the police force is not going to address the root causes of why these indigenous women and girls are vulnerable to begin with. And that's a crucial place to start the dialogue. That's why there have been calls for a national inquiry. Calls for a national inquiry aren't politics. It's not about getting elected. Nobody gains from this. The calls for a national inquiry is about giving Canadians the truth, the facts, so that they can analyze their own solutions for how we move forward, in addition to giving First Nations a voice. Our Indigenous women and girls deserve better than a one-day political save face roundtable with no objectives, no targets, and no proposed outcomes. It is a pathetic response to the deaths of our women and girls on a weekly basis. We're in a crisis. If Canadians were experiencing the same level of violence, we would have over 20,000 Canadian women murdered and missing right now in the last three decades. They would call out the military. We would be under martial law until those women were protected. Why don't we get the same response? And part of that is what I'm here to talk to you about today, and hopefully we can have a discussion about it too. Because Canadians, as well as First Nations people, Métis and Inuit, deserve to know the truth. But what is that truth? It is not a crime. It's not a matter of those indigenous people over there, those other people who engage in criminal activities are just going around murdering one another. That is not the truth. It's not supported by any of the research studies. That's propaganda. And your job as law students is to sort through all of the political rhetoric and look for the fact. You need to dig deeper. When Prime Minister Harper says there won't be an inquiry, we don't need an inquiry. This is not a sociological issue, it's a matter of crime. Naturally then, it almost makes sense that the solution would be, well, if it's crime, give more money to the police. Seems to make a little bit of sense. When Minister Valcour says, no inquiry is needed, because we know what the problem is. These First Nation men have no respect for women or their rights. So, he has no solution. We're still waiting for what his solution is, but clearly the problem is, our problem. It's blaming the victim. So there's no action needed on behalf of Canadians and certainly not by the Minister of Indian Affairs. When the RCMP can stand before Canadians and look them in the eye and say, we have 1,181 murdered and missing Indigenous women, as if that is an authoritative source that is anywhere close to what the actual number is. They've already done Canadians a disservice before they've even gone on to the second sentence. When the RCMP can release a report on murdered and missing Indigenous women, and nowhere in that report does it talk about the number of RCMP who have complaints against them for raping, sexually assaulting, and violating Indigenous women and little girls. If they can't include themselves in their own report, then we're already behind the line. We don't have the information we need to address the problem. How am I going to convince Canadians that money for policing is not the solution to murder to missing Indigenous women if you don't know that the police are in fact part of the problem? If you don't know that a provincial court sitting judge pled guilty to sexually assaulting and causing bodily harm to indigenous little girls ages 12 to 17.
if you don't know this, then yeah, let's just throw money at the police. Let's just have a one-day roundtable. Looks good for all of us pre-election. But it does nothing to prevent this from happening to us again in the future, and it certainly does nothing to bring justice to all the families of murdered and missing Indigenous women. But worst of all, it is an attack on First Nation allies. How are you supposed to have any sort of empathy or engender any kinds of feelings of urgency that we actually have this crisis that we need to address? If really the numbers are small, it's really about people drinking and being intoxicated and it's about criminal activity. It doesn't really engender a lot of empathy. And that's exactly what the government is trying to do, more so than not spend money, because the National Inquiry is not going to break the bank. CSIS, D&D, &D, and the RCMP have an $11 billion slush fund that they haven't spent since 2007 to do monitoring activities. They could literally take $2 million out of there. So it's not the money. They wouldn't lose an election for having a National Inquiry. What is the issue? And the issue is the greatest threat to this government, the greatest threat to the status quo, is First Nations and Canadians becoming very forceful allies. That's what Idle No More kick-started. Those were the discussions we had across the country. And that's the greatest fear that this government has. So as long as it can pull out all of that propaganda and keep you thinking, well, this is an other person, this, this is someone else, this, these are a bunch of criminals, then nothing's going to change. Blaming the victim will be the path forward in terms of all of their speaking points. We have to expose the truth. And what is the truth? Truth is about facts, not interpretations, not political agendas, not whether you're voting liberal, NDP, or conservative. It's about the hardcore facts. And the facts that Canadians need to know is that the root causes, there are root causes for the vulnerability of Indigenous women and girls that are created by Canadian law as a matter of policy and it's maintained by the gross violation of our laws as a matter of policy. So law has a very direct impact on whether or not our women and girls are going to live to see another day. And not because the law in and of itself can do anything, it's just words on a piece of paper but it's who's implementing and enforcing those laws, who's interpreting those laws. And it really gets in the way of the truth here, because the truth is, murdered and missing Indigenous women didn't start with the Highway of Tears in the 1980s. It didn't start with Helen Betty Osborne in the paw. And it's certainly not going to end with the most recent attacks and murders on our Indigenous people in this country, unless we do something to stop it. The vulnerability of Indigenous women and girls in this country is no accident. This is not about a policy gone wrong. The Minister of Indian Affairs cannot trans uh, show a education policy and say, well, we had the best of intentions we didn't mean all this residential school stuff to happen. That, that doesn't hold water for residential schools, and it certainly doesn't hold water for Indigenous women. The laws have been very targeted, very direct, and so have the policies and actions of these governments over time. But the only way to understand how the law manufactured this vulnerability and maintains it by not following modern laws, is to actually go back and understand the context. And oftentimes, groups will ask me to come in and say, can you just go through the chronology? You know, can you start with the highway of tears and bring us forward to Tina Fontaine? Well, it didn't start with the highway of tears, in fact. It all started because, and keep in mind, 
This issue of murdered and missing indigenous women doesn't start and end with our oppression, doesn't start and end with the violence that is inflicted upon our families. Indigenous women and girls have been here since time immemorial from beautiful, wonderful, diverse indigenous nations. The reason why we're targets is because we're so strong, we're so powerful, we are the life givers of our nations, we are what keeps our nations going, we're the educators, we're the comforters, but we're also the kick-ass political strategists, leaders, negotiators, and decision makers. Some of our indigenous nations in the past, it was the women who decided when a leader was in and when a leader was out. And in other nations, it was us who decided who can go in what parts of our territory, when and for what purposes. Now strategically, if you're going to attack a nation, I would be attacking those warriors first. But they misunderstood, they miscalculated, they didn't understand that our strength wasn't about power that that strength actually comes from resilience. The reason why our nations are still here are because we have survived and have the ability to survive everything that they have thrown at us. There's a lot to celebrate in our Indigenous women. It's not just about how we're violated and oppressed. We're powerfully connected to the lands and waters, to the plants and animals. We're powerfully connected to our own indigenous legal traditions, our own laws around with every benefit comes a responsibility. We can't use something without giving back. We have to protect the lands and waters. Why do you think indi the Idle No More was so full of so many indigenous women and girls? The very same people who've lived in child and family services, who have been overrepresented in prisons, who have been vulnerable in urban cities, who've had their children taken away from them by child and family services, were on the front lines of Idle No More saying, we have a responsibility to protect this territory. We promised you we would do it in the treaties. We promised you we would do it in our alliances. And that's what we're going to do. There's, there's a lot of good reasons why we should be standing up and protecting these women. Because in my estimation, Canada is in a crisis of epic proportions. And if we don't do something now to turn this ship around, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble. Canada needs a hero, and Indigenous women and girls can be that hero for this country. But we have to be here. We have to be alive to be able to do it. Canada knew, the colonial governments knew, that if they were going to have any chance of dispossessing us of our lands and our resources, they had to attack our women because that's the strength of any nation. And like the old saying goes, a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground and they haven't stopped trying since contact to put our hearts on the ground. Legally, policy-wise, through funding agreements, through neglect, in all of these ways, Indigenous women have been oppressed. Because Indian policy, very simple, it only ever had two objectives. One, to obtain our lands and resources, and the other one was to reduce financial obligations acquired through treaties and other agreements. And they only had two ways of doing that. Assimilation, and I think most Canadians are familiar with that. What's assimilation? Loss of language and culture losing your Indian status, not allowed to live in your home community anymore, the place that where you were confined. The discussion Canadians have yet to have is the second method of obtaining our lands and resources, and that's the elimination of Indigenous peoples in this country, targeting Indigenous women. They don't teach us that in school. They don't teach us how law and policy has targeted indigenous women and their reproductive systems to try to stop our nations from existing in the future. So this is the real murdered and missing indigenous women chronology. 
doesn't start with the Trail of Tears. The very first murdered indigenous woman and little girl in this country came with the scalping bounties in Nova Scotia in 1749, where scalpers were paid 10 guinea for each head of an indigenous woman and child. That's how you decimate a nation by upwards of 80%. My nation was decimated not from smallpox, not from poverty, not from a harsh winter, but from scalping bounties enacted by law. And by the way, they're still on the books. So I hope you're all my friends in this room. Forced relocations. Imagine taking the Mi'kmaq, who own all of the maritime provinces, who protected all of this territory for generations, and put them in tiny communities, and you're not allowed to leave. It's against the law. So you have to be dependent on rations, and those rations are only between 60 and 80% of what you actually need. So what does that mean for your lifespan? Only 60 to 80% of you are going to survive this. M murdered and missing indigenous women were made vulnerable a long time ago, long before now, and it hasn't changed. The Indian Act is a very direct example of disempowering and oppressing indigenous women and girls. It's a very specific law that says you no longer have a political voice, you, you can't run in elections, you can't lead your community, you can't even be in your community or access your community should you choose to marry your treaty partner, the people that you live and work with and trade with, the whole reason why we sign treaties to live together in harmony. Women will pay the price for that and so will their kids. In the 1900s, you have residential school murders and you can't call them anything else than that. When little girls go to residential school and they get raped and violated and tortured and abused and experimented on and die from it, that's murder. A whole lot of people probably will never be charged for murder but that's murder of little girls. When schools, some residential schools, have a scenario where upwards of 40% never made it out alive. And the response by the superintendent general is, well, that's no reason to actually stop because the whole purpose of residential schools is, quote unquote, the final solution, getting rid of the Indian problem. Not just by civilizing us, and making us unbarbaric, but by physically eliminating us. And how do you address forced sterilizations of Indigenous women and girls that went on for decades in this country and even paid for by Indian Affairs? Even after it was against the law to forcibly sterilize people without their knowledge and consent. Imagine being a 12-year-old girl walking into a doctor with a stomach ache and coming out sterilized and not even knowing the kind of trauma and violence that does to a woman or a little girl. If this is adopted into society as part of the norm, is there any wonder why we have problems today? Is there any wonder why some look at indigenous women and girls and blame them for their own misfortune? What about the thefts of our children? Is that not a violence against Indigenous women? Does that not, in and of itself, make them vulnerable? Of course it does. More than any other act you could name today, you take my children away and you have effectively killed me on the inside. I wouldn't be a human being anymore. I can't imagine. And it's the reason why we can't stop demanding a national inquiry and an emergency action plan, because this hasn't stopped. Cindy Blackstock, a staunch advocate of First Nation children in care, has said a thousand times, this situation is actually worse. The theft of our children has gotten worse, not better. Our socioeconomic conditions over the last 20 years, far worse, not better. The impoverishment and chronic underfunding of essential human services 
that indigenous women and girls rely on, like food, water, housing, mental health services, education, all of those things, those tools needed to actually survive are denied many indigenous women and girls. This is a problem and it's maintained as a matter of policy. Having worked in the federal government, it is absolutely repugnant to know that policymakers sit around the table and say, well, if we don't fund water this year, eh, this many people will probably die of water contamination. If we don't fund housing this year, we can calculate with some precision how many people are going to be at risk for violence and mental health issues and homelessness? And where do the vast majority of murders and violence and missing Indigenous women and girls happen from? Urban centers. Not First Nations like Minister Valcor would have you believe, but urban centers. Many of these women and children have home insecurity, food insecurity. And this is a matter of policy. And today, in addition to this legacy, the intergenerational trauma and the ongoing onslaught and targeting of Indigenous women and girls, we have state violence and neglect. So the failure by the RCMP to do proper investigations, to even report that someone's gone murdered and missing. Of course they don't have the full numbers. They didn't bother to even investigate many of these cases. We will never know the full numbers. They have been criticized the world over for their failure to investigate, just treat these people like human beings. And this is part of the problem. If the very fundamental basis of the law in this territory is based on terra nullius, and the only way that I can legally justify taking all of this territory is that there's no human beings that are here, then all of these human beings that happen to be here have to be characterized as something else. Something less than human, something subhuman. And that gives you the very beginnings of your justification for treating people like less than human beings. That is somehow legitimate to dispossess and oppress because you don't have the same rights or obligations as human beings would. Because I can testify today, and I'm pretty certain as a lawyer, that we're now pretty much all considered human beings. We all have domestically protected human rights and internationally protected human rights. So why is it then that it's okay for one segment of society to consistently have their human rights grossly violated. Why is that okay? And what can we do about that? <clears throat> On top of trying to deal with this problem, our, one of our biggest challenges is racism. It's the biggest controversial word you can say because the reaction is always negative, I'm not a racist, you're playing the race card. Or, you know, you're just trying to be politically correct. Honest to goodness, I don't care what name you call me. You can't kill me with a name. Say whatever racist thing you want. But racism kills when we don't address it. Racism and treating Indigenous peoples like they're less than human allows a scenario where provincial court judges and RCMP can be part of the murderers and the rapists. That's how racism kills. It's not about name calling. It's not about political correctness. And we're facing not only this lack of knowledge and awareness in addressing racism, but also the victim blaming and the propaganda. How are we supposed to address murder to missing Indigenous women when the most important issue in the media is the First Nation Financial Transparency Act because all chiefs are millionaires and they're all crooks? Honestly, because if, if that was the standard, if crooks were the standard, then we need a Transparency Act for the Conservative government. We need a Transparency Act for the Senate. We need a Transparency Act for the RCMP.
But how can we even measure the, the, the importance of murdered and missing Indigenous women as a matter of law and policy if the law that's getting the attention is the First Nation Financial Transparency Act? But we can't just not address it because hidden in the First Nations Financial Transparency Act is all of those racist ideas and propagandas that were crooks, were the, were the victims of our own uh, misspending that really we're to blame. So if we can't address that on an ongoing basis and fight the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and waste time doing that, we're not going to get to have that conversation over here where it really counts, where people are dying. And that's part of the problem. There's only so many battles you can have at once and still try to maintain a light on murdered and missing Indigenous women. <coughs> and it is not just rhetoric about root causes. The socio-economic, political and legal context of where the phenomena of murdered and missing Indigenous women come from is extremely important. No piece of legislation that any brilliant lawyer could ever enact is going to end murder to missing Indigenous women if this is still the scenario. If you keep stealing all of our kids, if 40% of all the kids in care are Indigenous, if, we're, if we represent 30% of the prison population and increasing, the number of Indigenous women in prison are supposed to increase by 150% in the next five years. That is absolutely alarming because what does that mean for the children? We know that they're mostly single moms. We're still very vulnerable. What about all of the homes? We need 85,000 homes across this country. We're not going to resolve homelessness until we address homes, for example. And if it's not the RCMP murdering Indigenous women and girls, well, they can expect a life expectancy of 7 to 20 years less than regular Canadians from preventable causes. The conditions of poverty in this country have the same amount of deaths as all the other leading causes of death, like uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases and cancer, for example. This is what the recent studies show us, except on our end of the, of, of the equation, they're all preventable. It's simply a matter of addressing the purposefully maintained chronic poverty in our communities, the ongoing dispossession. It's not good enough to say, well, if you want to be self-governing, you should have your own money. Well, you know, if you gave us maybe a little bit of our land back and a little bit of access to our own resources and stopped introducing legal barriers to inter-First Nation trade, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And that's here, here. part of the problem. Here's the real problem. Here's the real issue, the, the most important issue that we need to talk about. This 1181 number, aside from it being really offensive, really the best you can say is that that's all that's known. Because that's all the RCMP has said, that's all they bothered to record. I'm never going to say that that's all that we have murdered and missing in this country. But that's a huge problem. The root causes, the law, the failure to abide the law has created this scenario. 16% of all murdered and missing women in Canada are Indigenous, but we're only 4% of the population. That's a sociological phenomena. And I agree with Harper. It is a crime, but it's a crime on Canada's part, not our part. We didn't ask for this. Of the known murdered and missing Indigenous women in this country, half of them, half of them, imagine in Manitoba, half of all the murdered and missing women are Indigenous. Like, that's half. 
It's hard to believe those numbers, and I'm sure it's worse than that. Saskatchewan has come out and said the number's actually more like 59%. That is a crisis. We shouldn't have any murdered and missing women in this country, but certainly not Indigenous women. <coughs> As compared to Canadians, and I don't like to do that because nobody should go murdered and missing, but Indigenous women and girls are three times more likely to suffer violence. The homicide rate is on the, on the rise, or it's on the decline for Canadians. And we're more likely to be attacked by strangers. And interestingly enough, despite what Minister Valcora or Harper says, we're less likely to be murdered by our spouses than Canadian women. That says something. So all the messaging around, well, it's all these First Nations men who don't have respect. I'm not saying there aren't First Nations men with problems. But what I'm saying is, don't say for an entire col collectivity of nations that the problem are First Nations men. Because the statistics don't bear it out. So what do we do? What is the solution here? A national inquiry won't fix that overnight. It's an important step to knowing what we don't know, and that's the thing I am most scared of. What don't we know? If there's one judge who's been sexually assaulting little girls in his care with the help of RCMP officers, how many more are there? The RCMP have jurisdiction over about half of the cases. That's scary. I want them to come out and say this is wrong and condemn it and say we will bring our bad apples to justice. But I haven't heard them say that once. I haven't even heard them admit that there's a problem. And that is the biggest problem that there could be in terms of moving forward. If we don't have a national inquiry, we're not ever going to know the full extent of the problem. The continued discussion around law and order and the need for massive omnibus bills, massive legislative amendments, and now Bill C-51 to make sure that all those top five to fear people can't have websites anymore. That we need to follow people like Cindy Blackstock around, waste money that could be going to protecting Indigenous women and girls right this instant. That when they call and need help, there's someone there right away. That instead of cutting banned constable funding, you increase it. Instead of reducing the housing stock, you increase it. Provide mental health services, all of those supportive services. When Harper says it's a crime, the solution is give money to police. When Valcour says the problem is men, that's why you impose more legislation on First Nations. Clearly, they can't control themselves. Clearly, they have to be controlled by the federal government. Because your choice is sovereignty or women's rights. Because every piece of legislation that came down in that legislative suite, whether it was matrimonial real property, elections, or Bill C-3, the discourse in front of the Senate or in front of the House committees that were reviewing these bills, where I testified was always, it's either Aboriginal and treaty rights and self-government or women's rights. Because if you let First Nations take care of themselves, women are going to be thrown out in the middle of the night and they're going to go murdered and missing. And there's nothing in between. And so they have instantly not just created this problematic discourse, but now there's a disconnect between Indigenous women and girls and their own communities. They're going to be seen as the cause for causing all of these problems. They're the reason why the Harper government is bringing in all of this legislation. But they're all Trojan horses. There's nothing in the MRP bill for Indigenous women and girls. There's no protections contrary to what they said. And when called on this, they have no answer. The best they can do is say, we keep giving more money to policing. Okay, we're getting tougher on crime. 
We're going to stop terror in its tracks. What about protecting Indigenous women and girls? What about doing something to stop? What about a target? How about next year there is no murder to missing Indigenous women? And work backwards from that. How do you create that scenario? Law isn't just about reacting. Law can as equally be about preventing. It can be about managing relationships. It can be about setting minimum standards, which is what our human rights laws are supposed to do. Anyone who's taken those courses know. These are minimum standards. We're managing relations so that we get along well with one another. The problem is, even the research can be tainted. So calls were made. We don't know enough. There's research and information gaps. Let's have more research on murder to missing Indigenous women. So Canada issues a Merck's contract and says, let's do research on murder to missing Indigenous women. But the scope's going to be very limited to just family members and how they hurt Indigenous women and girls. We're not going to look at anything else. No other socioeconomic, political, or legal factors. Nobody outside the family. It's just inside communities. So what do you think the results of that study is going to be? Well, of the people that they conduct the research with who have suffered violence, it's going to be from those com community members or family members. There, it's done. You've got your research to justify your law after the fact. And we have a much better vision for how law and managing relationships in this country is all about. So what's the deal here? Racism we know is killing people. We can't move forward until we deal with it. If the advocates for murdered and missing Indigenous women can be labeled as bad Indians, top five to fear, militants and radicals, aside from falling under Bill C-51's Anti-Terrorism Act, what chance does this give us to even advocate on our own behalf? Are we going to have to rely on federal government responses to address our issues? Or if women helping women is now going to be a crime? We can't seem to escape law's obsession with making every aspect of our lives criminal. From being heathens and savages subhuman so you can take lands and territories, and when I say you, I mean Canada as in the state, to now our thinking, our very private thoughts and conversations under C-51 can be considered terrorism acts if it's a threat to sovereignty, and I don't know, every time I speak I say I'm sovereign, and this is, I'm my nation's sovereign, and I'm on sovereign territory, and I have a sovereign right to defend and advocate and stand up and give a voice to murder to missing Indigenous women who no longer can. There's lots of conflicts in these laws that are false. They're phony. They're created and manufactured by the government and the people using these laws, not the laws themselves. There doesn't have to be any inconsistency with Indigenous legal traditions and human rights. There doesn't have to be any inconsistencies with Indigenous legal traditions and making sure that we all live here and share and, and be respectful. There never was or there wouldn't have been treaties. The problem is not respecting those laws, both Canadian legal traditions and Indigenous legal traditions. It's the gross violation that has caused these problems. Oh, yes, okay, yes. So the problem, <laughs> part of what is going to change the conversation and what is actually going to bring action to words is how we educate ourselves. I don't know everything about murder or missing Indigenous women and all the root causes. You don't know everything there is to know. But we need to talk to the experts and the people who do know. And I guarantee you, this man is no expert. And if this is the source of your information, if this is the source of your analysis and opinion, even if you're a conservative, even if you respect the Prime Minister's position, then we're in trouble. 
because he's offering rhetoric and propaganda and not facts. Harper's view of Indians is that we're all terrorists. We're a threat to the economy, which he seemed to have screwed up by relying on oil anyway. But that being said, part of this problem here is that it's not just First Nations who are engaged in this project of decolonizing and analyzing Indigenous laws and Canadian laws. Canadians have all been colonized as well. From the time you're born, the entire education system educates you in a, per, in, a, in a specific mind frame. Think about a legal education, and I'm sure it's completely different here at this university. <laughs> but in other universities, <laughs> you might not necessarily learn all there is to know about law and its interaction and theory and conflict and resolution and the multitude of legal traditions that are in this territory. That's part of the decolonization that we all have to go through. It's not about guilt. Nobody in this room did anything directly, but everybody in this room benefits from the dispossession and oppression and continued maintenance and poverty of Indigenous peoples, including Indigenous women and girls. Even if it's not to your mind, even if you've never thought about it this way. And all I'm saying is, now that we know better, you can force Canada to do better. Because First Nations have their Indigenous legal traditions and their responsibilities and their core obligations to protect the lands and the waters and the peoples and everyone in our territories. But Canadians have the numbers, they have the power, they have the education, they have the influence, they have the contacts. Imagine bringing those two together on a permanent basis to make government in Canada of the people, by the people, for the people again, instead of a one-man show. And we have the power to do that. We have the power to say the problem with murdered and missing Indigenous women isn't all criminality, that part of the problem is the police force itself. And how do we address that? Throwing money at them might not do that. A First Nation Oversight Committee might. A Métis citizens group in an urban area might be able to have an impact, to be able to bring about change. But money at the problem, the people who are committing the problem, isn't going to change it. And we have to start opening our eyes. Willful blindness kills as many of us as overt racism does. This report is all over the internet. Human Rights Watch, those who take us away. Everyone should read that and hear the stories of Indigenous women and girls who were violated by the RCMP and the ways in which they were violated and how that's been allowed to happen. We should read the United Nations reports. They have no interest. Certainly the United Nations isn't going to gain points for calling Harper out for failing to deal with murdered missing Indigenous women. I have far more trust in a United Nations scenario than I do a domestic scenario. But we have to learn the uncomfortable truth if we're going to get to how we actually get to the solutions. And what are one of the solutions? Well, the families of murdered and missing Indigenous women have, for a very long time, many of them, been calling for a national inquiry. The majority of the provinces and territories have called for national inquiry. Every United Nations body that I've worked with, testified before, or read a report from has called for a national inquiry. Legal experts, sociological experts calling for a national inquiry. Women's groups calling for a national inquiry. First Nations leaders calling for it. Why the resistance? Why the resistance? And what harm would it do? So you as an individual don't believe in a national inquiry, I don't want to spend two million, four million, six million on a national inquiry to tell me what I already know. Okay, 
Well, what about giving voice to the families of those murdered and missing Indigenous women? If there's only one family who says, I will get healing from telling you how it has impacted my life and my community and my family and my nation, so that people know the truth, the facts. Because nothing stops us from also having an emergency action plan implemented tomorrow in partnership with Indigenous peoples and the state. Nothing stops us from doing that. A national inquiry does not stop us from doing anything. It doesn't stop us from funding housing. It doesn't stop us from amending laws. But I think this is now less about needing new laws and more about let's just abide by the ones we have. How about some equality? How about some safety? How about following up on a missing person's call? How about not letting an abusive man come back to that woman's home over and over and over and over and over and over again until he kills her? How about we just deal with that stuff? We're not the only ones making this call. And there's a reason why I'm going to New York in a couple of weeks to talk about murdered and missing Indigenous women to anyone who will listen. There's a reason why I'm going to England to tell our original partners why we have an issue with murdered and missing Indigenous women. And it's not because I think Harper's going to change his mind about the National Inquiry. But it's because I have the benefit of standing here today. I'm not murdered and missing. So I have an obligation to say we have an obligation to do better. It takes such a minimal effort. And it's so easy for everyone in this room. You don't even have to draft new legislation. You don't even have to oppose legislation. You just have to do what's right. It doesn't take a law to make you do what's right. And to do what's right is to force our government to act. We have to, we can never give up. We have to shine a light on all this darkness and uncomfortableness because if just learning about it makes us uncomfortable, imagine the people who've suffered it. Imagine Rennell Harper. My uncomfortableness at reading anything, even though it might make me cry or upset or really disturb me, is going to pale in compa comparison to what some of our little girls have suffered. And it's not just First Nations anymore. All of these things, it's a slippery slope where the canary in the coal mine were the litmus test for what's going to happen to Canadians. And you can see it now. Bill C-51 is passed, second reading, and they're going to ram through debate, not unlike Bill C-45. You don't even have your own democratic rights and freedoms respected anymore. It's a slippery slope until you're in a scenario where Maybe you want better education for your kids. So you get no education at all as a matter of policy. What we're doing is we're standing up for everybody in this territory. And another reason why I do this is because of Helen Betty Osborne. My mother-in-law, Annalise Dumas, was Helen Betty Osborne's very bestest friend. And to this day, she still can't talk about the loss of her best friend without being utterly heartbroken. And that's just one scenario. Imagine little Tina Fontaine, a little tiny girl, lost forever because when NWAC was saying 10 years ago, Canada, you need to do something about this, Canada refused to acknowledge that there's a problem. Now that the RCMP says, well, in fact, we have a problem, and Harper's still saying, well, there's no problem. It's just a crime. It's kind of reminiscent of when he said, there's no history of colonization in this country. We're not going to move forward unless we force the government's hand forward. And so what I'm asking is that the people in this room Think about, make it your project, make it, a, make it your mission, use social media, talk to your friends, maybe your parents are MPs, and say, a national inquiry is not going to hurt anything. 
it has the potential to change everything, but it's not going to hurt anything. And if you don't like that national inquiry while the people are off doing it, why don't we take some emergency action steps to protect our women and girls now? Why don't we address food insecurity and housing insecurity and provide equitable health care for everyone so that situations like Brian Sinclair don't happen anymore? There's a reason we have Jordan's principle. Our kids shouldn't be getting substandard services. So even if you don't agree with Aboriginal treaty rights, put that all aside. Let's just talk about basic human services, the kind of stuff that keeps people alive. And let's just make sure if you get $15,000 for school, we at least get $15,000 for school so that we have a school, we can educate our kids, and there can be more kick-ass women standing up and saying, regardless of the terror bill, I'm going to stand up for my people. Instead of having to worry about the daily grind of, do I even have enough water for my kids? Because Canada's better than that. Wealthiest country in the world, we're better than that. And the treaties envisioned so much more. If you break it down into nothing else, the treaties and alliances where there were no treaties said mutual respect, mutual benefit, and mutual protection. Indigenous peoples fought in all of Canada's wars to protect this territory and to protect the rights that Canadians valued, even if we didn't. Now, our Indigenous women and girls are under attack, and I think you have a treaty obligation to stand up and have our backs. It shouldn't be a First Nation burden to bear alone anymore. And I don't think a national inquiry is going to hurt that. So if I could ask, if I could ask just that, that everybody in this room did something, sent a tweet, talk to the media, talk to your MP parents, and keep the light shining on our murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls until it's no longer a problem and the government can say, can you just stop talking about it already? Because honestly, there's nothing more that would make me happier than if this wasn't a problem anymore and we could go back to fighting about politics. Thank you. Sure, so there's time for questions because I was watching the clock. It's like I was in the AFN election. Okay, I have two more minutes, one more minute. Um, and it can be about anything. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's an election year. And in that context, I mean, I, there's a running joke, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, nobody I know seems to like, the, the conservatives are like Nickelback. Nobody I know seems to like them, but they still do very well. Um, but uh, so in that in that context of, of an election year, um, what are some, what are the positions of the other parties, and how do you feel about uh, where things are going? Specifically with regards to murder to missing Indigenous women. Well, as per usual, the opposition parties are calling for a national inquiry on murder to missing Indigenous women, like they were in support of Kelowna and that's the way opposition parties work. There's no guarantee of anything, just empty promises. It's, it's good political fodder in the sense of, you know, the more support the better and maybe one of those people will do something about it, but I would never in a million years place all of my hopes on an opposition party to do something about murder and missing in women when and if they get elected. The problem is right now we need a solution right now, an all party solution. Because it's it's not about politics. It's not even like this anti terrorism legislation where you can say it is, but murder and missing indigenous women is it's not a liberal or conservative ideology or socialist ideology. There's just it's just wrong. It's inhuman. People are dying. We have an obligation to prevent that in Canada. You know, uh, 
the definition of genocide is creating the conditions of life that leads to a group's early demise or people in that group, criminal negligence causing death, failure to provide the necessities of life. I mean, these things are already crimes. It has nothing to do with political stripes to just deal with it, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, thank you, excuse me. thank you for coming to speak with us today. I found the talk to be really illuminating. Um, could you speak a little bit more to the necessity for an inquiry when a large majority of your talk was dedicated to outlining what I would take to be the reasons for the situation as it, as it exists today? So there doesn't seem to be that much of a mystery as to why this is occurring when we've had other commissions in the past that have sort of explored this issue. So what's the necessity of an inquiry as opposed to just the action that you're discussing? It's a good question because what I talked to you today was very high level basic research. That's the best I can give you. Generally, here's what the law has done to Indigenous women over time. Do you want to know specifically 16,000 Indigenous women lost their Indian status and 16,200 non-Indigenous women gained Indian status? And so, you know, there, there's, there's lots of those kinds of details. But for murder to missing Indigenous women, a national inquiry, if done properly and in partnership with Indigenous peoples, would tell us what we don't know and shine the light where people don't want it shone. So, I can tell you about the RCMP report, but what does that tell you? That in their best guess, there's 1181. Not a word is mentioned of the RCMP or the extent of the problem in the RCMP. How extensive is it? Are they one-offs, like serial killers? Or are they a big problem? Constable Kevin Terrio was able to take that intoxicated woman that he arrested out of jail while his other co-workers goaded him on and his superior said, well, you arrested her, you can do whatever the F you want with her. And he got seven days of no pay. We only know this by accident. How, what else don't we know? And that's the thing that a, nas a properly done national inquiry could do. Compel people to talk, compel information, not like the Truth and Reconciliation where Harper doesn't want to give documents. I mean, all of the truth, lay it all out on the table, and maybe there isn't a problem with the RCMP. Maybe it's all the OPP, or maybe it is all Native men. But we need to know that in order to address it. And if it's a much bigger problem, like we seem to think it is. People ask me, when did I first become aware of murder to missing Indigenous women and the role of police? And it's like, I've been scared of police since I was a little girl because I was told to be scared of police. Don't go around them. Don't talk to them when it's dark. And there's reasons for this. We need to get at this. Why is there an underlying fear of the RCMP in this country? And it's not just because of recent protests. And I think... That's what we need to know, what we don't know. Shine the light in those dark places. Do you think uh, the media has stifled any real discussion by focusing so much on a question of inquiry or not? Or like it's allowed uh, Mansbridge in the interview with Harper to ask, what do you think about an inquiry? Harper says no, and then he's on to a question about Duffy. Like, do you think the media is, yeah. Focusing too much on the inquiry question instead of just finding factors. I think the media is struggling right now as well. I think the media, and I mean I can't generalize because not all media. There's mainstream media, and then there's you know indigenous media, and and all those other things. So I'm trying. I'm not going to. I'm going to try not to generalize, but I think they're struggling right now as well. They have far less access to the government or state players than they've ever had in history. And it's not like you can be, I don't know, let's just say Craig Oliver would choose to be very aggressive to the conservative government and say, well, I'm not going to take this. Tell me why you're not having an inquiry, but what about this and what about this? And what? He just simply wouldn't get the interview. There, it's being very controlled. And that's what I mean by this isn't just an issue for First Nations anymore. 
Canadians should be very concerned that the media is very controlled right now, that we have no access and that they're looking at more rules to make it even more restrictive. I, I would be shocked if the Minister Valcour actually went out and gave a real interview to anyone during these roundtables. I would be shocked. You'll get maybe, if you're lucky, a couple speaking points and all of the media know that. Um, media could do a little better job of talking to the people who are impacted. Um, that being said, they've done a lot better job in the last four or five years, in my estimation, of trying. There are people in the media that are trying. They're looking for the facts. They're wanting to know how laws are interpreted. I mean, I've spent the last three years just talking to media people who call and say, okay, before I do this show, what's the problem with C-51 again? What's the problem with MRP? They're trying to understand it, where before it was just the headlines. Inquiry, no inquiry, another death. Chiefs are crooks. End of the problem. <coughs> They're their, their own victims. So I think we have an obligation to make sure we have a free and open media too. And I think if media does its part in making sure that all voices are represented, then those voices will be more inclined to support the media and their access to people like the minister or Prime Minister Harper, because it's not just a problem internationally with media access anymore. We have a problem right here in this country, in my view. <laughs> yep. Uh, the, the talking point that I hear a lot from conservative uh, MPs and ministers, especially whenever this is asked, is the, t the very simple talking point that uh, we don't need an inquiry, we need action. Um, what, is your, what is your response to that? Yes! <laughs> do something! Please do something! Action isn't give more money to the police, hire a few more judges. Clearly, they're part of the problem. If they would take action, if I had to choose between an emergency action plan and a national inquiry right now, I would choose the emergency action plan. If we're so poor, we can only afford one. Because we have to save these women. What concrete steps are being done right now other than amending a whole lot of pieces of legislation of mandatory minimum sentences and anti-terrorism and all this stuff that we're allegedly under threat for? Take action. I would be so happy if I could only choose one, and that would be the one. I want to say thank you. You got to the spot. I also want to say, you know, we've been talking about this a long time. Um, I facilitated a national roundtable in 1998, uh, hosted by the Aboriginal Nurses Association of Canada, looking at uh, ending violence against women, and we had um, representatives from all across the country, and we developed an action plan. There's been numerous action plans since then, through NAHO, through provincial governments, and nothing's been done. I think the, the beauty of an inquiry would be that it would pull all that together and it would show the sustained efforts we have made over time to do something about this. The other thing that it would show is the interrelationships between policies that, as you say, in addition to the law, are making women vulnerable. And I'll just give a quick example. Here in Ottawa, a case, a young mother, three kids, relapsed in, 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 in terms of her addiction. A neighbor, the housing authority reports it to Children's Aid. Children's Aid takes the kids immediately, does an investigation. Um, that's their policy. When you lose your kids, the policy of housing is that you lose your housing. There's no longer, you, you don't qualify for that unit because you're only a single person policy, the next policy, so she, now she has no children. She is heartbroken, as you said, devastated, so her drug problem that hadn't been that bad worsened significantly. Now she has no housing. The policy of welfare is that when you don't have an address, you lose your welfare payments. She has no children, no place to live, no money, no income, and a drug problem. Within a year, she's one of the murdered. You know, that the, the lack of compassion is heartbreaking here. Um, at, any, at any point, had they just left the children with her and allowed her to get treatment, 
any kind of compassionate support to this woman. You know, it would have prevented what happened, but that was just a spiral. Anybody could have said what might happen. And so an inquiry will allow this uh, examination of all of these different policies and how all of them together, it's a coordinated effort to make Native women more vulnerable. Um, and we need, that's what needs to stop. We need actions against that. But most people don't see it in that light. What you hear about from the politicians is, oh, well, she was a sex trade worker. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're trading their body for a place to sleep. You know, when you've taken away every other uh, right that they have to housing and so on to their kids. I guess I'm sitting here wondering, what's the role of the law in this? Well, I'm in a law school. So, abiding by the law would, would do well, uh, like human rights laws and, you know, protecting Aboriginal treaty rights and, you know, restoring the loss of lands and, and things like that. Um, but what you're saying about a national inquiry, if nothing else, it would be an accounting. Here's what we have to account for. Here's everything that's happened in the last hundred years. Here's every report, every action plan, unaction, unaction, unaction. And exactly what you said. It takes an awful lot of work and orchestration to keep us and maintain us in poverty. It, we spend an inordinate amount of money to do that. How many times has Cindy Blackstock said, for every $1 you invest in a child, you save $7 down the road? Well, for the $100,000 it costs you to keep one man in prison for a year, you could have spent 60 grand on a four-year education and 40 grand on mental health supports and extra health and good housing and maybe some healthy food and vitamins. And then what are his chances? What's a woman's chances with a four-year education degree and healthy food versus take my, women, take my kids away, take my house away, take my income away, and I know exactly where I'd be. It's not a matter of personality or someone being better than someone else. You take away everything from someone, and of course something bad is going to happen. But we're paying an awful lot of people billion dollar industry to keep this in place. Every year, almost four billion goes to INAC bureaucrats to keep us right where we are, and that doesn't include all of the provincial social workers that get paid billions of dollars, six-figure salaries, trips all over the world, when the people right here at home are going murdered and missing. So your point is is so important and just keep saying it, it's an accounting. We need an accounting of what has and hasn't happened because what hasn't happened is equally as important. And we need to connect all those dots. I'm going to interrupt the flow of these great questions <laughs> to ask you all to join me in thanking Dr. Palmatier for being here.